Welcome back, the man from Texas, the tall Texan, Mr. Eric Taylor. Thanks, y'all. Play a few songs. Keep going. One, one, one time I was playing at this big festival. It must have been three or 4,000 people out there. And uh, of course, any time you play a big festival like that, there's going to be a drunk guy sitting right down in the front. Um, that, uh, and he'll say things to you like, Hey, man. Hey. Why are you tuning? How come you tuning? <laughs> and I said, you ask me, why do I tune? And, yeah, why you tune, man? And I says, well, you see, it's a piece of wood, and it's it's got steel strings on it and atmospheric conditions and uh, heat and fans and uh, altitude will put it out of tune, so you have to retune it every now and then. He said, I don't understand that. You t- you're trying to tell me that you tune in because of the weather? <laughs> and I said, no. By God. No, I'm not tuning because of the weather. I'm tuning because if I don't tune, I sound like Jerry Jeff. <laughs> because Jerry Jeff don't tune. He don't give a shit. Jerry Jeff will tell you, I ain't got a tune. I got two houses in Belize. <laughs> if you don't like the way I sound, then go ahead and go away. But you remember the old Jerry Jeff day? So, I mean. Remember the old Jerry Jeff days so when Jerry wouldn't tune? You remember? You'd love it back then. It was like he would be doing a song called Sangria Wine. Remember that song? Sangria Wine? So that's why I tune. So. <laughs> I'll play this song about uh, here. It's a kind of a, uh, it's another one of my happy ones, I'm afraid. Okay. I lived up in New York City, lived in Greenwich Village in 1985, worked at a place called Back Pocket Studios where I got to work with some of my heroes of my life, people like Dave Van Ronk, Eric Von Schmidt. I was a kid uh, getting to work with some of the people that I had loved their music since I was 16 years old. Uh, Anyway, I got a job engineering up at uh, Back Pocket I just pulled up off heroin in 83. I stopped shooting heroin in 83, and I got this job in New York in 1985 where heroin was making this incredible comeback. Uh, Heroin became the coolest thing you could do, I think. I mean, that's why so many uh, theater actors and and movie actors died of uh, overdose in in, in that time. And uh, even... I met some people, even from the New York Ballet women that were strung out on heroin. And uh, what was really crazy about it was is that it became such a chic and such a thing that they were naming it after musical instruments, thinking they were going to fool the cops, you know? So like over in Brooklyn, you'd have this black tar heron. 
and uh, it would be just as black as hell, like black as the seats here, and it'd be real thick, and they call it uh, a clarinet. And then over in New Jersey, they had this uh, brassy fall apart in your hand heron uh, that was called trombone. And um, in, in, in Manhattan, where I was living over in the village, they had this, somebody had invented this heron with, it was honey brown with stripes in it. Obviously, it was some very good stuff. I think everyone that I didn't uh, get back into it myself, but I used to watch from across the street, everybody buying it. It was, heron was cool. And um, it, it, uh, it interested me because in Manhattan, what they named the heroin after there was uh, mandolin. <laughs> I guess they thought there weren't that many bluegrass players in, uh, in Manhattan. What they didn't know, though, that there was a Polish band that lived right down the street from me <laughs> that had 160 string players in it, and 100 of them were mandolin players. So uh, these poor guys walking down the street with uh, mandolin cases were all just getting busted by the cops. So was, <laughs> they were old men in, 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 in hush puppy shoes, you know. And Bless her heart. Anyway, this is a song called Manhattan Mandolin Blues. Uh, that's the back story, back line, boy. Playing this mandolin Put this thing down And then I pick it up again Things don't get better I might can hold out to live But I can't make no money Playing this man. Virginia, I steal a car today. Up near the East River, I steal something every day. It's gonna take more than some damn Chevrolet to drive these Manhattan. Well, 
I could take you someplace Wash your hands, wash your hair Get yourself clean, girl, get you something to wear So many things can happen just between now and then How many strings have I got left On this mandolin Put it on the table, baby, count it out thin Ain't enough to carry, baby, boot it on in Come looking when I'm out again I'll chase you down with my mandolin Maybe spotting me 50 toward my 44 Anybody ask me, man, I ain't ever seen you before And if I get to heaven, they might kill me again For playing songs about being merry on this man that lives Ain't enough to carry, baby, boot it on in Come looking when I'm out again I'll chase you down on the mandolin be this guy that lived right down in the bowels of Houston. <laughs> it used to be this friend of mine talking about the old days and, and, and uh, the old days of the heron. We, back in Houston, we all, I guess, placed ourselves in difficult situations and uh, me and Towns and Rex and everybody else, I guess, made some great mistakes and we ended up cleaning up. But uh, there was a guy that lived down in the bowels of Houston. Um, his name was um, James, uh, his name was Jimmy Harden, actually. His name was James Willis Harden. And he went by the name of Big Love because he was huge. He was very, very huge. And from, and from that standpoint, it, he, he was very shy. You know, in these days of Oprah and Dr. Phil, uh, I guess he would be called morbidly obese. It's amazing to me how we keep making up new terms to uh, insult people with problems. But... Uh, he would be called morbidly obese, I suppose, today. Back then, he was just a great big fat guy that sold the best heroin in Houston. So uh, <laughs> we didn't call him any bad names, really. We, he went, his street name was uh, Big Love, was his name. Big Love, his street name. Nobody really knew why he was called Big Love, really. story about him. He would get his, uh, his, his niece as she came home from elementary to pick up any piece of paper that she saw with a phone number on it. And he lived downstairs uh, underneath his mother's flower shop there. 
And he would also get his niece to pick up on voices that people would uh, drop. And he cut them off into these little things. With He would sit for hours and cut them off into these little things that looked like fortune cookie fortunes, you know, Chinese fortunes. And he would put them in this uh, cigar box. And on certain days, he would draw from the cigar box and he would call up a complete stranger and he could talk with them for hours. They wouldn't hang up on him. It was it was amazing to see because he became so animated. He was so shy in his real life but he was so animated when he was on the telephone. And they would have people he would have people, complete strangers talking about their ungrateful children. And their philandering husbands, and the, and how they were getting ready to lose the house, and so forth. I've seen it happen. Square business. Um, and when he put the phone back down on the receiver, though, I'd be sitting across from him, and you would see him shrink back into himself. He would pull away. He could see it in his eyes. You could see it in his face. It was almost to the point to where you could hear someone shrinking. There was almost a noise that he made where you could hear him becoming smaller. Quite a character. This is the song that I wrote for my first play that I ever wrote. Uh, we ended up, uh, when all of us cleaned up, or most of us cleaned up, uh, we lost track of Big Love and never got back down to see him again. Uh, Anyway, I wrote this song for the first play, and uh, it's called Big Love. I thought that I might call you up and talk about myself My name is James Willis Hart And I weigh 459 And my mother owns this flower shop down here off South Columbine And I sit down here with the roses And the roses in the baby's breath Never been no use to be Man, it's always been like this Sugar candy, beautiful babe. Big love, big love. Now 
you be still and you be good and you be Well, I used to have a parakeet But my mother's got a cat And I'll take her gun And shoot that thing If I can find out where he's at Now everybody thinks I'm crazy that lives around down here. Hell, if it weren't, if it weren't for Mother's Day, if it weren't for Mother's Day and Valentine's, hell, I wouldn't see it twice a year. mother sings almost every night well I guess I ought to hang up now you see somebody's beating down the door and my mother's gonna be so mad about to bleeding on Say, big love, big love. Now my sugar candy, you're my beautiful baby. She would sing big love. She would sing big love. Now you be still. South Carolina and sitting out there was a guy named Billy Harbo with a pair of cut off jeans no shirt on and he was uh, he had a, a bunch of Piggly Wiggly grocery bags you know and uh, he, he had a red Crayola with him and he would draw hearts on it and fill in the hearts and draw another heart and fill in the hearts you see we were carnies then. We were all in the, working for the carnival. And Billy 
was one of the best known knife throwers in the whole carnival business. He used to throw these brown Howards. Brown Howards, they were called. They were throwing knives for carnival acts, of trick throwers. Well, he didn't want to do that, see? What he wanted to do was be an artist. We always wanted to be artists. And then we all grew up and realized we were just carnies, really. <laughs> I love the carnies. Love being one. But, uh, you know, people said about Billy Harbo that he was good at what he did because of what was wrong with him. And I immediately understood that statement. I knew exactly what they were saying. I thought they were talking about me. Billy was probably known as one of the best knife throwers in the carnival business, Howard Browns. But what he wanted to do is become an artist, no longer carny. So what he wanted to do was become what he called a pawn shop knife thrower. What he did was every, every town we went into, we'd go to a pawn shop and we'd buy the cheapest Korean and Chinese and American switchblade knives that you could buy. And he would practice with throwing those, you see. <sighs> well, he was really good at it. But people said that he was so good at it was because of what was wrong with him. What was wrong with him was he had scoliosis. Like his back was shaped like that. And on that wonderful hot Sunday morning, I watched the sweat run down his back into his cut off jeans. And his back was as brown as a walnut. And he just kept filling up those bags with hearts, you see. And then I walked up behind him and I said, hey, Billy, you're supposed to be a friend of mine. <laughs> and he didn't look up at me. He said, hey, back at you, man. Hey, back at you. Well, Billy had a wife who was 17 years old. Billy was 21. I was 19 years old. Billy had a wife named Janet who was a slack wire walker in the carnival. You know what a slack wire is? It's instead of a tight wire where you walk across the top of the tight wire, the wire comes down like that, almost two feet across the ground. You, she gets on it, and she would get it to swing back and forth like this, and she could walk up and down it, up and down it. And she had sparklers and hula hoops, and she had hair down to here, my God. And, and she had these perfect little Barbie feet, you know. And um, I, I thought she was extremely talented. I never missed one of her shows, actually, I must say. Well, that particular Sunday morning, uh, Billy filled up his bags of hearts, and he took them over, and he put them on the bale of hay in the back of his blue station wagon and he walked back to me and there's every step that he took he opened up every one of those knives with every step that he took he never lost my eyes he looked me right in the eye and every step that he took he opened one of those knives and then he fanned them out, looked just like a Japanese fan, just like a Japanese fan. And he turned and he threw those knives into most of those hearts on the back of that bag. And that's when I knew that Billy Harbo was a poet. <laughs> he was a poet. He could say more with less words than anyone I'd ever met in my life. He was telling me that he knew what was going on between me and Janet. Well, a regular man, a man with spirit and courage would apologize 
and say, now, Billy, let's settle down now a little bit and have a drink, you know. We'll talk about that. Well, I wasn't one of those people. I left in the middle of the night. I never saw Billy Harbaugh, my friend, ever again. I got Christmas cards and birthday cards from Janet for eight or nine years following. But never heard from Billy Harbaugh again. I did hear tell from the Christmas cards and the birthday cards that she and Billy didn't work out, as you might imagine. And that she left and went to Michigan, actually. And she lived in Three Rivers, Michigan, and married a lawyer up there and had some children. So every time I pass through Three Rivers, Michigan, I think of Janet. But the thing that I think of most, really, is that how many friends that I had that I wish I'd have treated better in my life. I've had many friends. And uh, when I look back at my life now, I wish that I had treated most of them better than I did. Because we all think we treat our friends well. But then uh, we look back on it. There's incidents that happened where you would think maybe I could have done better with that one. So it's a song called All So Much Like Me. Because I was an arrogant little bastard and I only liked people that I thought were like me. I can't say sorry anymore. Well, Billy had a girl as cold as a switchblade walked the wires at night. Born and raised on a Carolina midway, she said she liked my songs all right. All right. All right. You know the Cassie Bond was a fiddling juggler Outside Baton Rouge We got laughing drunk on tennis balls Fiddling blue suede shoes These were friends, they were friends of mine Strictly first name basis Memories are stitching time. I'm no good with faces. Well, they all had smiles that I remember. All were born in late September. All were prone to the cabin fever, man. They were all so much like me. They were all so much like me. They were all so much like me. Man, they were all so much like me. Yeah. You know, Sonny was a Filipino boy, and he lived in my backyard. And he broke my grandma's dandelions, catching snakes in jar. 
I think she whipped us much too uh, You know, John had an El Camino car And he dressed it up in primer And he took his girl to the wedding church And she never did look fine And he went to Mexico without yeah, these were friends, they were friends of mine. Strictly first name basis. Memories of stitching time, hell, I'm no good with faces. But they all had smiles that I remember. All were born in late September. All were prone to the cabin fever. Man, they were all so much like me. And they were all so much like me. And they were all so much like me. And they were all so much like me. You know that Billy had a girl as cold as a switchblade. She walked the wires at night, born and raised on a Carolina midway. She said she liked my songs. She said she liked my songs. All right. I said, all right. Okay. All right. Thanks, y'all. I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. <laughs>